This podcast is sponsored by Ingrock. Ingrock is the premier delivery platform for apps, APIs, and IoT devices for millions of users today. It provides the ability for developers to easily deploy their code by collapsing the complexity of the CDN, WAF, API gateway, and global network load balancing into a single SaaS service, while allowing CISOs and network operations teams to standardize their networking controls, auditing, and observability configuration for all network ingress in one place. If you are building a product that needs access to data, systems, APIs, or devices stuck behind a network firewall, check out ingrock.com today. And now, on to our show. Can I get the icon in the cornflower blue flower? Hey everybody, welcome to episode 29 of Can I Get That Software in Blue? I'm one of your hosts, Chad Tindall. Along with me is my co-host with Market Insight that's never off track. In the world of AI, he's leading the attack, the king of compassion, the emperor of empathy, Steve Mazak, everybody. Thanks for that warm welcome, Chad. I appreciate it. We're rolling with that emperor of empathy. That one's going to stick. Yeah. I don't know about right. king of compassion, but I was trying to think about yeah. other words like empathy and, you know, that's yeah. what I came up with. <laughs> Next time, try to work in like the plumber angle or garbage man, because I do those jobs as well. Yeah, you, you, wear, you do wear a lot of hats. You do wear a lot of hats. Have you been playing with any new AI tools lately? I'm using Lang Chain, Lang Chain a lot in my like software development, just trying to learn how to use it all. What are you doing um, with it? I can't tell you, obviously. No, I'm I don't mean what are you building? I mean, what are you using it for? Is it writing code for you? Uh, yeah, no, LangChain is just a framework to chain LM statements together. So I'm trying to learn how to use it in the context of Pinecone and Elastic and a few others and see what you can do with it. So is it a bit like auto GPT where it'll, you can have it, an LLM do something and then have it do it again and yeah, but you have to code in what it does, right? Unless you wrote a recursive function to execute lane chain over and over again, then it's kind of like just, you know, step by step, do this and do this, but you can take the output of one and then just feed it into the next, right? So it's kind of like your own little auto GPT, but, oh, it's, but it's, it's programmatic. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a Python library that I found by just learning about the AI stuff. And I'm like, I really want to start coding again. And so that's what I'm doing. Oh, that's yeah. so cool. That's yeah. so cool. And now I'm trying to learn VS code, which is fun and new for me. Cause I'm, yeah. an, Intelli I'm an IntelliJ guy. That's what I used. Oh yeah. For most of my development career. VS code is where it's at for sure. Plus with, with copilot built in and everything, it just makes it really easy. I mean, seriously, like I'm resisting the urge to go into chat GPT and ask it to write the code for me because I just want to learn the methods and stuff like that. The functions. Right. And part of me feels like I'm just wasting time doing that. <laughs> I've been looking at this new ChatGPT competitor called Perplexity. And, oh, yeah, I heard uh, about that one. So I think you told me about it. That's what I'm playing with this week. So we'll see how it does. So it's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, you start to learn, the more you use ChatGPT, you start to learn what its strengths and weaknesses are. And the weaknesses are pretty big sometimes. Big just gaps in what it can do. Yep. So. Did you see the announcement from Databricks about their LM? No, what is that? They introduced something called Dolly, not to be confused with Doll Dash E or Doll oh, E. Oh man, <laughs> this is D O. Yeah, it's D O L Y. Free Dolly. Yeah, they're trying to like help people build their own LLMs, and they claim that it does just as well as ChatGPT. So, oh, all right. Well, we'll see. It's a hot space. It's a hot space. Well, let's dive in. We have a special guest today, someone whose company I enjoy so much, I was inspired to write some poetry. So let's see how that goes. A virtuoso of value, she's the product queen. With a mind so brilliant, it's a sight to be seen. Once VP at Elastic, she thrived crafting strategies and systems where innovation derived. Her leadership and vision, both clearly classic, helped shape Elastic into something truly fantastic. Now she's with ClickHouse steering their course in the world of data analytics, a driving force. Her experience and insight, they truly astound. In the realm of products, she's the best to be found. With her in command, ClickHouse is set to score data efficiency and speed like never seen before. So here's to Tanya Brogan, a force truly grand in the world of tech product. She's the best in the land. Wow, Chad, I did not expect to be serenaded when I joined this podcast. You didn't you didn't quite share that with me. I feel very welcome. Thank well, you so much. Well, we did reschedule this episode a couple of times, so I had time to come back and iterate on this a little bit, but I hope you like that. That's also partly why, why Steve's intro was so short. I kind of spent most of my time on that one. That's fine with me. That was great. <laughs> well, this is going to be tough to top, Chad. Did Chad GPT help you with that one or did no, you end up on your own? No, written in quatrains, which are stanzas of four lines each. 
loosely an anapestic tetrameter, but not completely. Chad, after this episode, I'm going to take that. I'm going to put it in chat GPT and I'm going to say, did you write this and see what it says? Do it with the Bible too and see what it says. <laughs> I know. It's so funny to me. <laughs> Those LLM detector detectors are terrible. <laughs> They're so bad. <laughs> this was written thousands of years ago, but that's okay. It, it probably was generated by ChatGPT. Or maybe ChatGPT existed thousands of years ago when we just lost it in the dark ages. We don't know. Yeah, you never know. There we go. So let's dive into episode 29 with Tanya. Yeah, so Tanya, welcome to the show. We're excited to have you on. And I think maybe we should start with just your current company, ClickHouse, because it's a relatively new company, but not relatively new product. And so I just want to give the listeners an idea of what exactly does ClickHouse do and why did you join? And then we can kind of go from there. Sounds good. Of course. Yeah. So ClickHouse is a database. That's the simplest way to explain it. It's a database focused on a certain type of workload that we call analytical workload. So this is data that's written and I would say seldomly changed, right? Which is actually a lot of data. A lot of data that's generated today is actually of that nature where you maybe write a log of events or you have some sort of information that you just want to keep track of over time historically. And so this kind of analytical data then drives all kinds of things. Application development for SaaS, and there's analytical features that you may want to build and you would need a data store, or even internally, each company has just stores and stores of analytical data that you want to analyze. And the difference for ClickHouse is, first of all, it's open source. So anybody can just take it and use it. There's many proprietary solutions in this space, but ClickHouse stands out as being one of the most popular open source offerings in this space. And it's also, as Steve, as you mentioned, you know, it's quite mature from a technology perspective. It was open source in 2016. It has quite a long runway now in terms of production usage. And while the company is fairly new, the technology itself is quite proven. That's interesting. So it started in 2016. What was the founder's inspiration for creating it? Like what didn't exist that they felt they had to go and create a new backend? I think it's actually because at the time there wasn't an open source offering. As I mentioned, in this space, there's databases that have been prevalent. Vertica is a good example, right? Column-oriented data store, but it's proprietary in nature. In the cloud era, additional data stores have evolved in a cloud-native space. So Amazon Redshift is a good example. But again, there was sort of this gap for an open source technology. And so this was built, open sourced, and now can be enjoyed both by enthusiasts, maybe looking for an analytical store, you know, to couple with their embedding search, as well as by organizations looking for a mature, but ultimately open source and self-hosted solution. As you were talking, Tanya, my mind kind of probably naturally went to Hadoop because you're talking about open source analytics, big data. Why isn't Hadoop just the answer for everybody in 2023? Yeah, that's a good question. Hadoop really was a great system for analyzing data, I would say kind of in a batch-oriented fashion. So the kind of the MapReduce framework, you know, very, very much successful there. Where ClickHouse focuses is this slightly newer area that now is becoming kind of a term, which is real-time analytics, right? So you're analyzing, same kind of workload, same potential scale, but the results come back in milliseconds, right? Maybe seconds. And so we're talking about real-time answers to pretty complex questions at huge scale. And that's really the sweet spot for ClickHouse. Would you say this is really more of a snowflake competitor, but it, you know, as an open source? Yeah, mm -hmm. you can think of it as like a real-time snowflake. That's exactly right. With snowflake, you can do some real-time question answers, but it really, it has come out more out of a traditional data warehousing space, where if you look at the kinds of problems that it was aimed to solve, it was actually moving, say, Oracle or Teradata from on-premise to cloud. And so like their success is like, oh, you know, we sped up a 32 hour report to be 10 hours, right? And that was sort of like the benchmark for the Snowflake like workload. Again, just a very different workload, more offline batch processing, whereas ClickHouse focuses on real time use cases. So as an example, in addition to that report, there may be an interactive dashboard that executives want to see. You may not want to build that on top of Snowflake. It just wasn't built for that. And ClickHouse would be both just a better fit technologically and more cost effective because like maybe you could do it with Snowflake, but at what cost? So oftentimes ClickHouse is used as what we call basically like a speed layer next to say Redshift or Snowflake or BigQuery and similar cloud data warehouses. You use them both. You can. Yeah, it depends on the workload. Like we wouldn't say that we're replacing Snowflake because again, if you want like a 10 hour report that you're running more in a batch fashion, this is just not the use case that we are focused on, you could do it in ClickHouse, but you may be more successful with a traditional data warehouse. And you would also be looking for additional features there that ClickHouse doesn't necessarily offer. 
a more tr yeah, transactional workloads. And for ClickHouse, you would probably move a subset of the data into ClickHouse for kind of real-time analytics and reporting. So, Tanya, is it right then to think of ClickHouse as like its own distributed system? It manages its own storage. And based on what I read, it really doesn't have a lot of external dependencies. So it's kind of a self-contained thing. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, it's a columnar store. So again, like in terms of how the technology is built, it's a columnar store similar to Vertica, Redshift, even Elasticsearch, right? Elasticsearch had a columnar store. And so interestingly, like you asked earlier, how to end up at ClickHouse, at Elastic, we were actually targeting some of the same use cases with Elasticsearch that ultimately I saw our customers move to ClickHouse. And it wasn't because Elasticsearch was a bad technology. It also had a columnar store, but the ClickHouse solution for certain verticals was just a more, I would say, optimized fit. So for instance, from a resource perspective, like certain use cases, like it would take, I don't know, some amount of CPU and RAM to process in Elastic, and it would be like a tenth of that in ClickHouse, just because of the way the architecture was optimized only and specifically for like structured data processing. So does it use like object storage behind the scenes or can it use anything you throw at it? So traditionally, the ClickHouse clusters were using a shared nothing architecture, which is uh, local disks. Now, having said that, in an analytics space, increasingly, there is interest in shared architecture where you shared the storage, like shared object store, some sort of, sort of other shared store architecture. So ClickHouse supports both. Traditionally, it was used in a shared nothing context, I would say, in the majority of the cases that I've seen in a while. But it is possible to use object store, and that's actually how we offer it as a cloud offering now. Oh, God. So what are the benefits then of using ClickHouse with object stores? Is it just storage cost? Cost is certainly that. And especially for internal analytics, that's where some, sometimes cost becomes a driving factor of can you even implement this use case? Another reason is actually manageability. Steve, as you know, like again, Elastic was excellent at sh shared nothing architectures. They had a really good and sophisticated clustering algorithm, but it, it does come at a certain cost. Uh, all the rebalancing costs, for instance, of that cluster and keeping it, keeping all the state it's a non-zero cost, certainly in terms of like storage overhead and resources, but also in terms of predictability, for instance. And so object storage can be useful from just a, how do you grow? How do you scale? You can independently scale compute from storage. You can independently kind of rebalance workload on the compute side without having to rebalance the storage itself. And so there are certainly some benefits even from kind of a query processing perspective. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And is it fair to think that like the way that you think about storing data and compartmentalizing data in ClickHouse, maybe this is wrong. It's just like similar to how we did with Elastic where you use time-based indices and things like that. Was ClickHouse similar to that where it's one good way to partition data is using time-based thinking or is it something else? Yeah, so the structure that ClickHouse uses behind the scenes to store your data is called Merge Tree. And actually, it's a kind of similar process to Elastic. Like you're optimizing for very fast inserts. So you're inserting data, but you don't immediately put it into this Merge Tree structure in the most optimized way on write. You just want to land data. And then behind the scenes, there's a merge process that then goes through and optimizes that data for fast retrieval. So you can get very fast and very, I would say, high throughput insert, but behind the scenes, you also get very fast queries based on kind of this merge that happens. So a lot of these concepts are similar. The implementation is slightly different. And, you know, again, there's a columnar store with a merge process in the background optimizing how the data is on disk for retrieval. You joined late, what, like January 2022? Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. It's now 18 months. It's hard to believe it's been that long. At the same time, it feels like I've been here for, I don't know, even longer in some ways. <laughs> I know how that goes. So when you joined, was the SaaS version of ClickHouse launched yet? It wasn't yet. So I joined right when we were just starting to work on the cloud offering. The company has existed for about four months. And, you know, as you might imagine, the first four months were mostly about company setup, hiring the initial sort of operational team and engineering team, in addition to the core database team, which already existed. So the cloud team was already, I think there were like 10 or 20 people, but the work on the cloud offering was just starting. So what was that like to be there that early trying to define a cloud product from the beginning? One of the reasons I joined was exactly that. So in my career, I've already had experiences working with products that existed or maybe I have built them up from scratch, but they weren't a SaaS offering. And so for me, a big attraction to joining a company like ClickHouse at the stage that I joined was exactly to have that zero to one experience building a SaaS offering. We have decided that our go-to-market commercially will be solely based on cloud. So we don't have an enterprise version of ClickHouse. If you run 
open source today, we can support you. But when it comes to our strategy from a commercial perspective, our cloud offering is our only commercial offering. And so building that out from zero to one was just a really attractive experience that I wanted to have as a product leader. I was certainly ready for it. And coming especially from a bigger company like Elastic, where I was used to having, again, established processes, established teams, there was nothing like that. We were inventing things completely from scratch. It was exhilarating. It was a little bit scary, I'll be honest, because I was like, there's nothing. There's literally nothing. And it's up to me to come up with this. I mean, I joined and the first question for me was like, Tanya, what should be our roadmap for cloud? Like, write it down, write it down. And I was like, okay, okay, let's just start writing down the roadmap. <laughs> you guys plan to keep releasing it to the open source and keep that going? Yeah, so the open source core database continues development in the open, right? So if you go to ClickHouse GitHub, all of our development, all of our road mapping happens in the open. We have monthly releases. The cloud offering is a hosted version of this database. We actually don't introduce enterprise features into the database itself. You know, for instance, like if we introduce a new function for our users that goes into open source. So the hosted offering has parity between what you run. If you choose to run it in self-managed mode versus cloud, what the cloud offers you is manageability that comes with a hosted offering, of course, and that's what we focused on building out. But yeah, the open source development absolutely continues. Are there any things you can do with the open source version that you can't do in the cloud version yet? Plugins or, you know, things like that? Nothing, nothing like that. Yeah, like we, we have really focused on keeping it very clean in terms of like our users having this, the, the compatibility between open source and cloud. The only, I guess, like thing that I would say like maybe functionally is different is the SQL console. We did acquire a company on the way to GA that was specializing in building a, a SQL console for kind of the broader analytics space. And we integrated that natively into cloud. So that's kind of a UI that's not available in self-managed. We have something called a play UI. It's like very basic and like a more advanced SQL cloud is in the cloud only. Like you can think of like in the Snowflake experience, you get in and you have your worksheets and you have your SQL workbench. That is cloud specific, but the core database itself, we've really made a decision early on to keep this API compatible between open source and cloud for ease of migration, also for use cases where some of our customers can go to cloud. And we, it's important for us to support them as well and to make sure that they have ability to maybe run a part of their offering, say like some you know, OEM offering where they're shipping a product on premise with cloud. And so they may use our cloud for like their SaaS offering, but then they'll use open source to embed it. And we, it's very important for us to have compatibility between the two. So Tanya, there's no real UI for ClickHouse as far as visualizing data, is there? Do you ship one out of the box? There isn't. Yeah, I would say in that sense, ClickHouse is different, again, from Elastic, where we had a stack pretty early on, right? Elastic had Elastic Search, and very quickly for the more like the operational use case, there was Logstash for data ingestion and Kibana for UI. There's no such equivalent for us, and this was actually an intentional part of our strategy. In that sense, we're more like MongoDB, where we really spread across many use cases, and there isn't a single stack to use with ClickHouse. There are multiple stacks, though. So for instance, if you're a data engineering team, you may use DBT, and you may use Superset, for instance. And Superset is a user interface, an open source UI that's uh, aimed at the BI space. And if you're in operational analytics or you know, DevOps, you may use ClickHouse and Grafana, right? A very popular UI for more kind of log analytics and trace analytics. So we actually have several stacks and we provide integrations with all of these, both open source and commercial tools. We make them cloud compatible and self-managed compatible. And there's really several stacks that ClickHouse can be a part of. It's so interesting. Like Grafana can be used for so many different things as far as the visualization front end, yet Kibana, which I loved, still only works with Elastic as far as I know. It does, yeah. Yeah, and this was an intentional part of our strategy at Elastic. And again, I do actually think having the Elk stack really helped adoption for the use case, the kind of the Splunk alternative use case at Elastic. There's something about a stack that really simplifies that mode of deployment. And so we'll see. At one point, it may make sense for us to kind of popularize a stack based on ClickHouse or a couple of stacks. But it's an open question for me whether we need to actually absorb like the pieces of the stack into ClickHouse and control them or not. Like I'm hoping we don't have to. I'm hoping we can keep that ecosystem somewhat open. Yeah, I mean, there was both at Elastic, right? There was the Helk thing that came out. There was the security onion stuff. Like people were putting Elk and other things and calling it different names. It's kind of fun. So there's no reason you can't do that for a long time with ClickHouse, I don't think. Are there any marquee cases for ClickHouse that you can talk about? Specifically, like, big customers that are using it or what they're using it for? Anything sexy? 
Yeah, th- there are definitely some. Um, so I can talk ab- about a couple that are on our website and you can read about. For this embedded use case where you're using it as part of a main data store, actually quite a few observability companies use ClickHouse as an internal data store for event data. And again, this is because it's so efficient at storing the you know log or trace or event data that you might need in an offering like that. So Sentry is a good example. If you've used Sentry for error tracking, its main data store for events and metrics is ClickHouse. So that's an example of just using ClickHouse like as part of your main data store. Chronosphere is another one, right? And there's actually scores of other startups and just companies in general building out observability use cases on top of ClickHouse. And when it comes to the broader kind of SaaS main store space, there's other verticals. So FinTech is another big one. The blockchain data, where do you store that? If you're at a startup in that space and you're crawling the blockchain data and you're storing it somewhere, ClickHouse has become a really popular data store for that, just as an example, because again, you need the same kind of processing you need. Events, time indexed, very efficient, very cost efficient, and very fast retrieval of this data. And there are many other verticals, the marketing vertical, the kind of the retail vertical. There's a bunch of companies that build SaaS offerings on top of ClickHouse. On the flip side, data engineering teams, you mentioned Snowflake as an example, may be looking for an alternative store for, again, some of this real-time data that they may be currently storing in Snowflake or Redshift, but need faster performance or just another stack for their internal use case. So those are kind of the two primary places in which you'll see ClickHouse used. All right, so Tanya, the next thing I want to talk to you about is your journey to PM, specifically from an SE when you were at ExtraHop. And I know you have a blog about this, so I don't go into repeating that. We'll put that on the show notes so people can listen to it, but there's a blog on ClickHouse where Tanya details this journey. But what I want to specifically talk about is moving from the SE role into the PM role. And you mentioned in the blog that like being an SE, being the first SE at ExtraHop was kind of like being a PM. So I'd love to hear from you and I'm sure people would love to hear what was that initial SE experience like and how did it morph into becoming the PM at ExtraHop? And then we can go from there. Yeah, there's a bit of a funny story there, actually. I would actually say it differently. I kind of fell into SE role first. I had no idea that I would ever be a solution engineer. I actually didn't know what it was. So what happened was I was graduating from the computer science graduate program. And this was after I've already been a consultant uh, previously at Deloitte. I went back to grad school for computer science. And I was thinking about what to do next. And one of my professors recommended looking into product management. I really didn't know what that was. And so I went and I chatted to a PM, I think that was working at Amazon. And that person, I think, must have been like an associate PM because like when I talked to her, I was like, I don't understand like what she's doing. Like it just was very unclear to me what the product manager role was for her at Amazon. But it still sounded cool. So I'm like, well, let me go like interview like whatever Google, Amazon, Microsoft, whatever it was at Seattle at the time. And I was kind of on track, like interviewing for these product management roles, not really knowing what it was about just as a way to get out of high school, not high school, but the grad school program and have my next step in the career. And then sort of by accident, one of my professors recommended that I talk to this startup that was just com- coming out of a stealth mode. And so I went and I talked to these founders at ExtraHop. This was the name of the company. And I was like, you know, I really want to be a product manager. And they kind of laughed at me. They're like, well, we're so early. we are just got our Series A. We're like two technical co-founders. We don't need a product manager. We're, you know, we pretty much know what we're doing with product strategy. But what we need is a solution architect. Actually, I think they call it a sales engineer. That was the title at the time. And we need a sales engineer. And I just heard the word sales. And like, I immediately was like, are you going to make me call people? I'm not going to do that. And they're like, no, no, a solution, a sales engineer is somebody who is technical, right? And it helps customers for a technical product like ours come up with the right solution for them. So again, this was an enterprise heavy sale and just needed, you know, you know, the, the average sale price was in hundreds of thousands of dollars, so very heavy POC, as you might imagine. And so that's how I actually came in and I became a sales engineer for them. And yeah, for me, this was kind of a very interesting experience. I didn't expect to like it, to be quite honest. I was like, I don't know if I'm going to like being in front of customers, but I loved it. I actually loved the thrill of being in a deal and chasing a deal and kind of coming up with a solution. I absolutely loved it. But there wasn't a PM, right? So basically, as I was meeting with all these customers, again, this was a Series A company, but we're still honestly trying to find product market fit, trying to figure out how to actually message and position our offering. I realized I was the expert in everything that we were doing from a technical perspective. So whenever somebody needed to update messaging on the website, they would reach out to me for credible positioning. Or whenever engineers needed some context on what should be built and why, they asked me because I was in front of customers. And I realized I was the de facto PM 
because there wasn't a PM. And even though the founders believed, you know, they didn't really need a PM at the time, they did. They actually did need a PM. And I was that PM. That's just and, amazing to me that you could get to actually raise a Series A and have no product management in a company. That's blowing my mind right now. It's not that unusual for startups with technical founders. And again, there's a reason for it. In order for you to start a company, you have to have a thesis on what your product will do in a market. You have to raise capital, right? You have to go convince investors that your vision is credible and defensible. And so absolutely, you should expect that founders are the original CPOs. Even if they have somebody with a PM title, for a long time, I actually think founders remain true like heads of product. They have the vision. They have really strong, not just feelings, but really thesis on the market and where this startup is going to go. So it's actually not that unusual at all, I find. I find that like to track with my experience too, is early SE work is like kind of de facto PM. And I think there's such a nice bridge between the two. So you kind of became the PM just because out of necessity and what you were doing. Yes. When did they eventually say, okay, like Tony, it's clear that you're the PM now, just take the job and run with it. So this fork in the road actually came when they decided that, when we all decided that we needed to grow the SA org and I had a choice. Do I stay basically the head of solution architecture and hire my first hire in that organization or do I become the full-time PM? Because at that point it was clear that it was a full-time job. And so I made the decision to go the PM route, even though I did love, I, lo I love the technical sale. I love being in, in that role. I, what I learned over time about ability to influence Go to market strategy, influence the choices, right? Because in the end, you always have limited resources for what to build. So that decision of what do you build now and why, and sort of making that very clear to everybody in the organization was my true passion. As it turned out, my professor was right. I did love being a PM. So I chose that career path. I always find I have an affinity to PMs who used to be SAs, even if I know they were used to be SAs or not, but there's something about having been an SA that gives you a certain je ne sais quoi as a PM, I don't know. A hundred percent. So I, since then, I'm very partial to as much as possible hiring people from what I call the field, by the way, not only solution architecture, support, consulting. I find technical leaders that are field facing to be, first of all, again, very, I would say in many ways, even more sort of, they have a pretty broad perspective on the market overall, where it's going, competition, right? And they can verbalize it very well because they have to as part of that technical role. And then it just becomes a question of, do you want to make the transition? Many solution architects are happy in their roles and don't want to make the transition. But if they do, I find that many of them can absolutely make the leap and go into product management. There are a few skills you do have to learn, but it's a very natural fit. And I've been very successful hiring folks from the field into product management. Yeah, to me, it feels like a combination of business knowledge, technical knowledge, and human psychology, like why people do things. Well, there's a lot of that in the SA role. And when you said there's skills you have to learn, like what did you mean? Yeah, there are a few things. And again, they're not like, I find that leap is actually not that, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not a very wide gap in skill set or anything like that. So the thing that I look for when I talk to somebody who's currently in a field role, have they already had maybe some transferable skills to come to PM and kind of hit the ground running? The first one is taking the insight from many of your engagements and synthesizing, you know, one sort of category of things to do and then being able to prioritize it. So you might say, you know, I, I had a few, you know, engagements this month or this quarter where this blocker came up. With some folks I talk to, there's a little bit of a recency bias in that, right? They say, okay, like my last deal needed this, so this has got to be the highest priority. But some of the best, you know, field leaders that I've talked to, they can take a step back and say, yeah, this last thing was painful. But if I really think broadly about my business over the last couple of quarters, thinking about where the market is going, I would say these three things actually have become more of a category of be that gaps or opportunities, and then they're actually being able to stack rank and prioritize it. That's the hardest part, right? The hardest part is actually synthesizing from kind of many experiences, a few things to focus on and being able to make that case. So that's one skill, sort of prioritization and kind of creating categories of use cases to address. When you think about how you take all this information from the various aspects of the field, open source, GitHub issues, all these ways that customers might be giving you signals, how do you think about prioritizing what needs to happen as a product leader? Like what actual process do you use to prioritize those things? There's many tools, by the way, out there. I don't believe there's like a tools answer to this. In the end, there, there are going to be more things to track than you will ever 
sort of have a chance to address. I think but even it's just very, philosophically. Yeah. So, so I think philosophy, like you said, is very important. I do it kind of from two ways, both top down and bottom up. So top down is actually thinking through your strategy more in, in, in a maybe one to two year time frame and thinking which market need are you going to address? And can you really communicate that in a succinct way? And then working from there, right? Like if you're going to address this need, how do you do this end to end? How do you, what gaps do you have? What opportunities do you have? Where's the market going? So SWOT analysis is like a, is a great way to do it. It's actually taking that use case and then analyzing your own current sort of position in that. And again, that's why analysis always moves because the market never stands still. The competition never stands still. But so, so looking at that very kind of holistically from top down and saying, okay, if we're going to address this use case, these are the things that we must do and revisiting it. But you do have to pair it with bottom up. So again, you will learn something in the process of engaging with your first customers, with your first users or, you know, second wave of users or whatever. So bottom up is just as important. That's where the field is your eyes and ears. As you know, technical sellers support users and customers themselves. And that's where actually I don't tr try to track every request. You know, what are, again, the categories of problems I hear about the most? And can I explain, you know, again, kind of going back to the top down analysis, why maybe we've missed them, why maybe we didn't notice them before and kind of working them into the, t the top down strategy. So you do need both, right? The top-down strategy, SWOT analysis, and then bottom-up with, I usually think of that as barriers to sale. We had this process at Elastic, actually, Steve, you may want to talk about it. Like to me, these top 10 lists are very valuable because again, you can have like hundreds of items, but if you had to boil it down to top 10, why you're not able to address something from a field perspective, that is very clarifying. Yeah. Yeah. So just real quick for people that don't know about this at Elastic, I stole this idea from David Letterman, believe it or not. I was like, what are the top 10 things that I want this company to build for our customers based on what I'm hearing from all the customers I talk to and all of the SEs in the field. And so we created the top 10 barriers to selling. And, you know, we had this meeting, I think it was like every three weeks, founder was on CRO, head of sales, legal, PM. And we made real decisions based on this list, you know, where we're going to hire people, Maybe we don't need to invest in certain areas. And I heard eventually the list got completely finished, but it only took a while. I won't say how long. <laughs> but the last one on the list, which I'm happy to say out loud, because it's done now, was the alerting feature and like building a more advanced alerting feature. But I think that process is very useful and it's like unifying and it gets everybody on the same page as far as why we're not able to sell. And one of the things I did, Tonya, the reason I created this is because I was tired of like people making excuses for why they couldn't sell something into an account, yet some of them were very valid, but they were solving the problem ahead of them instead of the problem that they needed to solve after. So I was worried that it was going to lead to us creating stuff that was only solving an interim problem where if we just solved the problem the right way from the very beginning, that entire problem set would go away and it would be something different. And so like you were saying earlier about PMs have to be very good at synthesizing things and like taking a step back. That's what I was trying to do with the help of, you know, you and others at Elastic. So one of the things I wanted to ask you, this is a perception I have. I don't know if it's real or not, is like when you're working as a PM, what's the relationship like with engineering? Is it a, you dictate what they build? Is it a collaboration? Is it just managing what the engineers want to build that in that sprint? How does that typically work? You bring a couple of interesting items. One is when we say PM, right? I refer to product manager, right? So we're talking about product management. There's other PM titles. There's program management, there's project management. So those latter two are really more about, there's also by the way, product owner, that's a PO. But all of these other titles are more about execution, right? So product management is about what we, sh we should build, what should we build and why? Can you explain that? Can you clarify it? Not how, by the way, right? You don't come to engineering and say, hey, you know, this is like the widget that I need and it has to look exactly like this. I would like the software in blue. You don't come to engineering saying that, right? You say- But that's the whole point of this podcast. Don't you? <laughs> <laughs> so no, like absolutely- Corn it has to be a, blue. Yeah, it has to be a partnership in terms of, because the next question is the roadmap, right? Like what we should build and why is not yet roadmap. Roadmap is a combination of that with an actual execution plan that is realistic. A PM doesn't come up with an execution plan. This is where a PM, a product leader, partners with an engineering leader and says, okay, and this is what we had to do for ClickHouse Cloud. It was like, this is a stack ranked list of things that we need to build. Now let's figure out by which milestone, what can we build by each milestone? Let's just say if we say three months from now, six months from now, I don't know, right? We need to sit down and figure that out. And it also has to do with staffing. It has to do with so many details. That's where engineering really is responsible for figuring out how to do it. It's not product, right? Product doesn't come up with the dates. You can't have both features and dates. Like you can have the features and then engineering tells you the date. 
Or you can say like, oh, we have this date and then the features is going to be whatever ends up being delivered by the day. You can't have both, right? But how much is engineering feeding back into that stack ranking and deciding what they actually work on? Well, any stakeholder, honestly, can feed into a stack ranking. Again, like the, a product leader is somebody who can explain what we should build and why. If an engineer leader comes or any leader or anybody comes, right, any person at a company or outside comes and challenges me on these priorities, I'm happy to listen. I'm happy to engage. It can be from engineering. It can be from the field. It can be honestly from anywhere, right? If I can't explain why we're focused on something, I'm failing at my job, right? Because then the priorities are maybe not as like defensible as I thought. So absolutely engineering engages on this. I love working with engineering leaders who you know, care deeply about what we're building and why, and will often challenge me. Now, is that always the expectation that they know their market just as deeply, for instance, as their colleagues in the field or in product? Not always, right? But I think the most effective engineering leaders absolutely do. And yeah, to, so to, and to me, this is very important, especially when you get to an engineering leadership role, like all of my colleagues who were like at the kind of director or senior director or VP level within engineering were also in many ways product leaders. They thought very deeply about the market. Same with startups. At startups, I think, again, roles often get blurred. And so engineers and product people often work very closely together on figuring out pri both priorities and what's possible and what's feasible. So, no, it's a partnership. I actually, one of the best quotes I've gotten on the subject actually came from the, one of the technical founders of ExtraHop. He told me, Tanya, you can't tell engineer what to do. You have to convince them something is the right thing to do. And that really stuck with me. And I think that is not, by the way, only for engineers. Any colleague, right? that's, you know, naturally curious, you know, would like to be convinced that something is the right thing for the company. Yeah. Leading by influence, clearly important. I'm going to ask you something that I asked the other PM. So we're on this. Steve knows where this is going. And I'm just curious on your thoughts. So if I said engineering should report to product management, change my mind, what would you say? It's interesting. So CPO often, like chief product officer, often the expectation is that you lead both product and engineering, that you have the background to both set the priorities in terms of product strategy for the company, as well as be responsible for execution. So I do think it's kind of a natural place for a product leader to also lead engineering, again, at a certain level, like at ClickHouse, my, my manager, my boss here, president of engineering and product. Yuri, he comes more from the engineering side, right? So I think it can go both ways. You know, you can have a product leader leading product and engineering. You can have an engineering leader leading product and engineering. I think in the end, you have to know like your, like wh where you've spent the bulk of your career and where you, so wh where you can focus as an IC leader or wh where you delegate. For me personally, if I was to, you know, to lead both a product and engineering organization, I would rely pretty heavily on VP of engineering just because I haven't spent my career, you know, building engineering teams. But, you know, I can certainly reason about it and I could do it. So I think it's not there's right or wrong answer here. I think both can work. Okay. You're the first person to say that. Really? Okay. Interesting. There's a lot of like, yeah, no, there's been a lot of like, uh, no, engineering should stay separate. You know, there needs to be, it needs to be more collaborative and less top, top down. If you did it that way, some people have said if you did it that way, you would never work on the types of maintenance things that have to be done to keep a, a software system healthy because product managers would only want you to focus on new features. We've heard all kinds of things. It's almost like they feel like they need an adversarial relationship to say, well, we can't work on those new features. We got to go do this other code debt relief problem or something. So I've heard about this from some of my peers. I'm not going to name which companies and some of my peers in engineering that have worked for other you know, Silicon Valley companies. I think this is less a function of organization and more a function of sometimes bigger organizations setting incentives incorrectly. So I've heard some anecdotes exactly chat as, you know, the company does not spend enough time addressing tech debt. And as it turned out, PMs at that company were incentivized and evaluated only on new feature delivery. So imagine like you're a new PM at this rather big company and the only way your performance gets evaluated is whether or not you've delivered a feature. And then you're also responsible for prioritizing let's say, take that on that same team. It's a really tough thing for you, even if you know something is the right decision to address tech debt, to prioritize that versus a feature that you know is going to help you get promotion. To me, that's completely broken. That is completely broken. And I was talking to peers about it. Like, it just breaks my heart because good PMs know that addressing a certain piece of tech debt is going to help their overall team move faster. And like, they know it. they can absolutely prioritize it given the right incentives. So what KPIs do you use for PMs on your team? 
So in the end, for me, it's about the strategic vision. Like, what are you going to do in one to two years? In the end, it's revenue. It's are you making money at the level that you have set out as an organization? You know, you have a certain plan for growth and it's led by product, right? It's led by product in many ways. Even if you have an enterprise sales force, you know, if a product simply does not have product market fit, it's going to be very hard to sell it. And so in the end, a product manager should be evaluated on the success of the product in the market, which is revenue. But it has to be more of a longer term plan. It's not just about short term revenue growth. It is about like, are you evolving the product in the way that helps you capture market share over time in the category that you've set out to choose? So it's ultimately that product strategy, it's the soundness of vision in the category, being able to defend priorities and being able to ultimately deliver on them and see the results. What kinds of things that you can actually, other than revenue, what kinds of things can you actually measure? At first, you just focus on customer acquisition, right? Are you are your are users signing up for your service? And for those that are signing up, are they converting through the stages of adoption that you've set out? Loading like in, in an offering like ours, it's loading data, starting to analyze it, ultimately adding a credit card, pay as you go. So for us, that funnel is everything, and we look at the level of growth within the total number of customers. How quickly and efficiently are they converting from a self service perspective? And ultimately, then the revenue growth will be kind of a trailing indicator because at first, those workloads will start small. But then you look at expansion, you look at retention, right? You look at, you know, which is like the opposite of churn. So these indicators are kind of the more detailed KPIs you'd be looking at. So Tanya, back on this org structure thing, like is ClickHouse trying to build like a hierarchical leadership organization, like a fairly typical management structure, or are they trying to do the quote unquote flat structure? Hierarchical versus flat. I think, well, so we're a very small company. We're still 150 people, fairly flat right now. And I would say we're building a flat culture. I mean, I'll give you a, an example of kind of like what I to see as far as leadership. So we acquired a relatively small company called Archetype in October. So that these folks have been with us now for maybe about eight months. They were a six-person company. So even earlier stage than ClickHouse. And I would say many of the folks there were... Not quite early career, but, you know, not yet, you know, like not tens of, not decades of experience or anything like that. And these folks have joined and I could immediately tell that they had a lot of ideas for how to especially address product-led growth, which is something that they were very successful with in Archetype. And some of the ideas that we weren't yet thinking about at ClickHouse. And so what I told that team, I was like, I don't care what your title is and like what you're officially tasked with. Like at the time they were focused on integrating this archetype solution into the SQL UI and they did an amazing job. But I said, you know, you can lead any effort related to PLG because you clearly know a lot about it and we have a gap and we have a gap in even thinking about it. And so the founder of that company, Justin, he sat down and he wrote kind of his guide to PLG, his thoughts on PLG, product-led growth for ClickHouse. And it was mind-blowing for us, some of us who have not really thought about it quite to the same level and don't, didn't have an experience kind of of three years of building up a company. And, you know, yeah, just like up all the way through the CEO, we sat down, we said, what can we adjust? You know, it, there was absolutely no sort of hard feelings about us not knowing this. Like we, we all recognized that we just, you know, maybe just where we're coming from, like we didn't do this, right? And this person who just came into the company did. And so that's great. That's the kind of thing we expect from everybody at, at ClickHouse. And yeah, so I would say it's pretty flat. Can you share any of the insights, like just at a high level, like one that stuck out or something as a good learning? Yeah, you know, I, one thing I just realized with product-led growth, the word product is clear. It's like the product itself has to be easy to adopt. There has to be a natural sort of like way for somebody to discover that it solves their problem, to onboard, to have a successful trial experience and start using it. The part that I think I was unaware of is like, how do developers really find out about new potential offerings, be that open source ClickHouse or cloud. I had no idea, for instance, just how widely Twitter was used kind of to share sort of like product insights. Like I was not very adept, honestly, at using Twitter. You know, when I was at Elastic, I would just retweet, you know, whatever Elastic was kind of putting out. And that was like the extent to which I engaged in Twitter. I never read anything on Twitter. Talking to some of these younger developers really opened my eyes to how technology is discussed, you know, and adopted in so many different places. So for us, it's really being where our users are and where our potential users are having those conversations, right, in a credible way. And it sounds very sort of trite, but I just didn't know a lot of these things. Like I didn't spend time thinking about it. And it was just really educational for me. That's fair. I mean, I'm surprised every time I go to Hacker News just how much discussion there is on specific topics. Like ClickHouse was on there a couple of years ago when I was doing my research and they were talking about 
someone asked, why does everyone like ClickHouse? Like, I'm honestly asking. And there was a bunch of responses about why they like it. So it's a very helpful community, right? Exactly. And there's so many, you know, similar communities depending on kind of the, the focus area they might have in mind. So let me go back to this. I want to close the loop on the flat structure thing. I, I vaguely remember early days of Elastic, there was a desire to keep things quote unquote flat in engineering, but I never really understood what that meant. And the implementation, the, at least the naive view I had at the time was like, oh, that just means like less managers. That's flat. Is that really what flat means? Or is it more of a empowering culture where anyone can talk to anyone about anything they want to move the product or the company forward? Is it that kind of mentality? That's how I interpret it. It's the latter, right? Because in the end, just even from a human like management and communication perspective, like the bigger you grow, you're going to have pockets of sort of communication. And in the end, like reporting chains become kind of how you manage it with bigger organizations. I think that's inescapable. Like inescapable. Like, as you grow, you're going to have some form of hierarchy. To me, it's more the expectation of what do you do when somebody has an idea that maybe outside of their sort of like immediate job description. Do you embrace it? Do you encourage these individuals to come forward and share it in a broad forum? Do you empower them? Do you give them time maybe to investigate this idea and backfill with another team? To me, that's really what flat culture is about and flatness. It's like, it's not necessarily less managers. It's more the culture that you have in terms of new idea and embracing them. So it's hashtag flatness is a concept. <laughs> Flatness, flatness is a mindset. I think so. I think so. And again, like I, I'm, I would happily debate it. Like I think organization structure, by the way, does influence things, but I think hierarchy is inescapable. And I think you should just embrace that. Yes, hierarchy will happen. It's really more about that hierarchy not standing in the way of innovation and openness of idea exchange. That's the difficulty that a lot of companies struggle with as they grow. I mean, Elon has always been really big on saying, you know, if you have a problem, you know, you need to go talk to the person who can solve it. Just go talk to them. Don't go up your management chain. Don't go down their management chain. And any manager who has a problem with you doing that, they're not going to last very long because I'm going to find out about it and I'm going to get rid of them. So just go talk to who you need to go talk to. And I really like that. I think Elastic, I don't know that they embrace that specifically, but that's what how it felt there, right? As an SA, I could go talk to an engineer who built something and say, hey, I'm having this problem with it. Can you help me out? And at other companies I've been at, they've been much more protective of engineering resources. Like, hey, Essays can't just go talk to engineers. You know, we got to protect the engineer's time. That's a super critical, valuable resource. Open a ticket. You know, someone will triage it and get back to you, that type of thing. And that it's so unpersonal. I can see where they're coming from, but at the same time, I don't know. I like the open, flat, whatever you want to call it better. I do too. Yeah, Elastic, I think that did that very well. I think the, the idea of open a ticket and triage it, I think it's really more about like driving predictability and execution, right? Like because of these additional conversations and exploring your ideas, yeah, that's going to create some amount of, not, not churn is not the right word, but it's, it's going to be less predictable what a team does, right? If at any point they can sort of stop what they're doing and explore an idea. But I think that's a good thing. I actually don't think that organizations should strive for perfect predictability in delivery. Certain things, it's important to hit a date. You've got, you know, a trade show that's coming up, whatever, Amazon, and you need to have something ready by that. Okay, but many efforts don't need perfect predictability. It's okay for certain things to be ready when they're ready, not, you know, completely off. But if it's, you know, off by a week because an engineer went and explored some really cool new trend that came up with, an, you know, as a result, came up with something that really helped in a particular deal or really helped with something else that maybe marketing is exploring. I think that's a win. You don't want to micromanage that, you know, in order to hit some artificial date that you've set. Well, Tanya, back to what you said earlier about incentives and engineering and what they build. I think this ties into this because you could create an incentive that is just about like latest, you know, how much have you delivered that yes. got released? And it's, well, that's going to incentivize people to just take the low hanging fruit and never do any of these bigger, you know, multi sprint epics that need to get done. And that was, that's been my experience too, is watching these incentives kind of create this culture where you only work on the stuff you can deliver within a sprint. Don't do anything else. Well, I've always wondered, how do you incentivize engineering to talk to sales or SAs more, right? And to have the broader view of the customer where they're not just, well, this is my feature and I'm writing it, where I really understand what the customer is going to use it for, how they're going to use it. So I don't end up in the situation where they end up using it in a way I didn't envision. Just organizationally, how would you sort of make that 
happen. Well, or Elastic did it by sending us on these, you know, every six months we'd get together. And so we actually had relationships between essays and engineering. And that was also unique, I feel like. I think, but that, Chad, what you're describing is still indirect, like getting together at an offsite and like having an engineer talk to an SA and learning about a use case. I think that's great and that should happen. But I think even more importantly, I think it's like, how do you create a culture where, again, it's okay for engineers, not only okay, but encouraged. And, you know, I would say like part of like how you work is that engineers engage directly with customers. And I think the best way to do it is actually to have the kind of escalation process where if you have a critical feature, for instance, that needs to get delivered for a customer a particular time frame, or there's a regression or a bug where this needs to get fixed on a certain time frame to have engineers directly talk to customers about the requirements, about the impact, you know, maybe like a certain bug is having in their environment, be on those calls. I, I firmly believe this is actually the only way to scale execution in highly technical products is having customers and SAs and engineers directly talk about the use case what's working, what's not. Oftentimes, tricky things, there's multiple iterations in addressing them. So, you know, as much as possible, like once it's determined that this problem needs to be solved, I actually don't think like a manager or a PM that even has to be as part of their equation. Like the best teams will self-organize to solve them directly. And I think customer input directly into engineering during that process is the best way to keep engineers connected to customers, to keep the field connected to engineering and have that empathy. Tanya, do you feel like that's a unique thing to open source companies and engineers that work for or on open source products, projects? Not necessarily. Open source is another thing. We will talk about this in a minute. I love working with open source communities. There's just some really interesting aspects there of what this brings to product management. For instance, we recently had a similar situation with a cloud feature. And if so, again, they, they could be working for Snowflake. And what I just described makes absolute sense. Again, I think this makes sense mostly in companies with enterprise-facing products, where, again, there's tricky, like very technical features that engineering needs to really understand the customer or their environment to be able to solve that problem effectively. You know, again, maybe less so in like consumer-facing, but yes, yeah, certainly in like infrastructure enterprise where I've been. And now we can talk about open source, Steve, but yeah, I wanted to first address your first question. No, that's fair, because I think there's signs along the way of when engineers start to get too far away from the customer. And it can be fairly obvious to the people that are on the front lines, maybe earlier than everybody else, because they're starting to see the disconnect. But how you write that ship, I don't know. How would you operationalize that to prevent, imagine at a large scale, a startup, it's different, right? But at a big scale, like at AWS, you know, there's thousands of sales teams. They would, you know, and maybe hundreds of engineers on a product. So they would take up all the engineers' time with these calls if they were allowed to. So how would you actually operationalize that? Yeah, so I think this is where, like, on the escalation side, this can really be support leadership. Like, they can say, okay, like, for certain types of escalation, it makes sense to bring in engineers, and you would have to trust that leadership to make that call, right? Like for top, again, top top, top spending customers, they're, they're most, I would say, critical escalations. I would argue, like, that's time well spent for engineering, to dig into those directly, as opposed to always working through a broken telephone on something like that. But so we're back to more... the hierarchy now. We are a little bit back to the hierarchy, right? It's true. In a big, you said about a bigger company, it's true. Like I think with big companies, at some point, you're at a certain scale where certain checks and balances are needed. At a smaller company, a, a lot more things are just naturally visible. And so I think there's less need for like very strict, okay, I have to go through support leadership. I think you could have a support engineer reach out directly to an engineer and just say, I need you on this escalation because it's like everybody understands this is a critical customer and a really time sensitive escalation. So I think it is easier at like earlier stage companies to do it just directly without having to go up the chain. And then on the feature side, again, yeah, at a bigger company, you would go through a product manager, but again, good product managers will bring in their engineering colleagues on the kind of the most important features to help them understand the context, right? And to, to the empathy for the use case and the persona whose use case they're trying to address. And again, like at a smaller company, you may not need to go through all of your leadership. You can just say, you know what, like I have got a customer call and I think I'm just going to add an engineer directly. I don't need to ask the manager. I don't need to ask my manager. It just makes sense because this is the kind of culture that we have. And as long as, you know, like you said, Chad, like you don't end up with a situation where you look at all of your engineers' calendars and they're all just filled up with meetings, I think you're fine. You don't need to go and like engineer this process. We had Rasmus on a couple of episodes ago talking about his new startup bucket. And he says, I, which I thought was so interesting, you know, a feature isn't done when you ship it. A feature is done when a customer uses it and tells you whether they like it or not. And that 
closing that loop of product development or extending the loop, I guess, further out. Do you guys think about it that way? Or do you have any way of feeding this data about who's using what features and how they're using it and all that back into engineering? Yes. Yeah. By the way, I don't know if Rasmus told you in his podcast, they use ClickHouse as their data store because you might imagine product analytics data. Anyways, I He did sure not mention public, that. Yeah, but it's public knowledge. I'm pretty sure they've done some sort of a case study. It just makes sense. It was like the kind of use case it was built for, right? Like highly structured data, very fast queries, right? G giving those insights back to a person like me, like a report on like how well my feature is doing in the wild. We absolutely do this. We actually have kind of a, almost like a private version of Bucket internally at, at ClickHouse based on ClickHouse, where all, all of my product analytics are going to a central cluster where we're constantly evaluating success of new features that we build, you know, success of uh, just the underlying infrastructure of our cloud. And absolutely, those insights are shared not only with engineering, the whole company constantly in great detail. And any engineer actually can go. This data is anonymized, so it's not like they have access to private data of our customers. But if an engineer has a question about anything really at all when it comes to our cloud performance or our cloud you know, feature adoption, there's an internal real-time data warehouse based on ClickHouse that can go and query in addition to sort of me sharing the summary of that data. That's awesome. Sounds like you need to launch a bucket competitor. <laughs> well, no, not apps, necessarily. Apps on ClickHouse. Yeah, no, but this is our strategy is actually to be the data store for companies like Bucket. We're not at all focused on building these vertical SaaS services. There's so many verticals in which this data store makes sense for us to go after any individual one. That's just not the strategy. We're more like, again, a MongoDB, but for analytics, like a very flat platform oriented company helping developers like Rasmus. So, Tanya, are you working with some of the major partners like Accenture and those? in the world to help them use ClickHouse in their projects? Or is that a later thing or kind of they'll come to you type of thing? That's going to be a later thing for us. We have some interest, inbound interest from like system integrators, not specifically Accenture, but similar companies. And they're interested in particular for their enterprise customers figuring out their internal data strategy. So less for like using ClickHouse as a developer for like my product. Developers make that choice. They really don't need usually kind of an, an advice from a system integrator. But for internal data warehousing strategy, there are some big questions here for companies, right? There is, of course, the cloud data warehouses, where if you've made that migration, at least your data warehouse data is in the cloud. There's a question of, do you keep it in like something like a Snowflake, or do you move it to S3 and then have multiple query engines connect and query it? Do you have this data mesh approach? And so there's lots and lots of questions, and it's what's called data landscape. And so this is where system integrators can be partners good partners to larger organizations and figuring out that strategy. Some of them have approached us, but, you know, it's like I, for us, like really partnering with those companies is probably like a year out, I would say. You've worked for open source companies for quite some time now. Like what keeps you working for the open source companies versus going back to something like an extra hop? So when I first applied to Elastic, I, first of all, like I really didn't know anybody in the company. I've gotten very cold, like a gore of picked me out of, Gaurav was the PO product at the time. He was a previous guest on this forecast. He told me he literally picked me out of like a bunch of resumes. I was like, hmm, that's interesting. And sort of like eventually I passed the interviews and I got in and I was very lucky I, to be on the ground floor of Elastic, I think a hundred person company at the time. And I was fascinated by open source, but I knew nothing about it. Like I literally had to learn everything about what is an open source community? What is really the process by which you partner with key kind of users in the open source community? on building out a product. And I was fascinated by it. Like there's some aspects of almost like consumer product management in working with open source because you don't know all of your users. You can't track them. Like software can be downloaded and used by anyone. And really you have to think almost like about sentiment analysis. You know, you're looking at like reading through the tea leaves on GitHub or on forums or in Twitter. Like do people like your software? Do they not? What do they think about it? What use cases are they thinking of using it for that you may have never dreamed about? So this is the part that I love about open source. It's so unpredictable where a project is going to go and what is going to get adopted to be used for. Like even with Elasticsearch, you ask Shai, like, did he know they were going to get into kind of log management and like kind of Splunk alternative? He didn't know that when he wrote Elasticsearch. Like over time, just the community was like, you know what? Rashid was like, you know, I'm going to build Kibana and I'm going to use this for log search. And suddenly it's a thing, right? The Elk stack is born. This is what I really find amazing about open source. ClickHouse is, again, has a huge community of external users and contributors. It actually has, is one of the most popular projects to contribute to in a database space. It's very open in terms of accepting contributions externally. 
And so like, for instance, right now in the vector search space, our community is like, yeah, you know what? We want to use ClickHouse to search and store embeddings. And we're going to contribute, you know, all of this technology to help make it happen in ClickHouse. I love that. You know, like I can make a decision about product strategy, but our community can influence it in very significant ways, right? And then be part of building it. And I just absolutely find it fascinating. I, I love a challenge, right? And to me, this is one of these strategic challenges where you can have the best top-down plan, but your community in the end is going to have an influence on it. And from my experience, the community takes you in the right direction. Often, it's like a really great partner in building out a future for a particular technology. It's very well said. I didn't realize that you didn't have that kind of experience coming in at the time. Not at Elastic, no. It was very new to me. I still remember getting a briefing from like our head of DevRel at the time on like what to do and what not to do on GitHub and like how do you respond to community a sort of like requests on GitHub. I mean, I didn't know anything, right? So I had to learn all of it, but it's fascinating and it's just so much fun engaging with the community. I love it. Probably so you guys are actually back. accepting patches from the community into ClickHouse? Correct. Yeah, this is a little bit different from Elasticsearch. I feel like Elasticsearch was, there was a two-step kind of contribution process, right? You had to often for core Elasticsearch features be able to contribute features to Lucene, which in itself is, you know, a pretty advanced project to contribute to. And that many, there's only a few experts in the world that can kind of contribute to Lucene at that level. And then there's Elasticsearch project itself. So it was difficult sort of for, I think it was difficult, right, to sort of bec just become an Elasticsearch contributor. With ClickHouse, it's a single code base. So it's a bit simpler. And also it's set up very well. It has been set up very well over the years to encourage external community contributions, including some very core features to the database. So it has something like thousands of overall contributors, and I would say dozens of very active core database contributors on an ongoing basis. Do they have to assign the IP when they offer a patch or is it GPL? It's a, it's a patch of two. So yeah, from a contributor perspective, it's extremely friendly. You sign a CLA agreement and that's it. You're contributing to an open source Apache 2 code base that anybody can use. Yeah. It's not an Apache governed project. It's not an Apache foundation project. So like, like Elasticsearch when it was still Apache 2, it's the project is governed, let's just say, by ClickHouse. But again, the code base is Apache 2 licensed. So anybody could spin up a ClickHouse SaaS offering? Currently, yes. Yeah, absolutely. I just hear a lot of, you know, there's a lot of talk about whether that should be allowed or not. Well, the way I see it is, you know, our strategy is really to partner with cloud providers. So our offering is already in AWS. It's already in GCP. If we drive enough business, like why should they build a competitive offering? Now, of course, if they do, I mean, look, we've all been at Elastic. We know some of the things you can do at that point. But my hope is that this whole space is also evolving and cloud providers are learning how to partner with open source companies. So far, we've had, we enjoyed a fruitful relationship with Amazon and with Google. And I hope that it continues. It's just, you know, it feels very natural kind of for us to really partner as opposed to have to fight with these cloud providers. Yeah. I mean, it seems like less work for them anyway. Like, just partner with the open source company that manages the software day to day. And like, we don't have to do that much and they're still going to drive usage on our cloud. I don't know why that wasn't obvious to them in the very beginning. Well, they're very customer focused, right? So that's why it's important for us to serve their customers well. In the end, if we're doing a good job building and running this hosted offering, bringing them revenue, both in terms of consumption of EC2 and storage and their marketplace. But yeah, like you said, like there's basically their customers are not asking for an alternative why would they need to invest? And if we're really just a net positive for them in terms of revenue and our level of growth. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Is there anything from the proprietary world that you miss in open source or you think could be adopted as a best practice or something? Well, this is where with enterprise focused open source, you get the best of both worlds. You've got the community from the overall just like adoption perspective, developer engagement. And then you've got your, you know, top and enterprise customers who are your, you know, multi-million dollar contracts and you get really kind of a very enterprise level of engagement. At that point, it doesn't matter that your distribution channel is open source or not. So I actually think you get kind of the best of both worlds working with an enterprise, sorry, open source project that's kind of in this enterprise infrastructure space. Yeah. So Tanya, in the field, are you and the, are the sales teams selling kind of bottom up similar to how we've done it before in our past lives? Or is this a top down, bottom up strategy combined? How does that work? Open source lends itself well for bottom up. So your software gets adopted and then you work with those organizations to understand if they have a need for your commercial offering. In our case, a cloud offering, you may want to migrate from on-prem or you may already be running it yourself in cloud. That's the smoothest path at that point. You just have us manage the offering for you. 
So that's a very natural one. At the same time, what I'm finding out is that, especially our cloud offering, it's serverless in nature. So you can run very small workloads very effectively in our cloud. And we also have designed some of our offerings at the lowest tier for really developers, right? I'm a developer and I just want to play around with ClickHouse. We've really focused on that use case as one of the use cases. And so I'm finding that technologists prefer that kind of as a way to just kick the tires, to learn and to start adopting the product. And so those are kind of the workloads that they're just starting in cloud. They even told me that they've heard of ClickHouse, but they've always assumed running an analytical data store themselves is a pretty big lift. And it is, right? And so for some of those customers, it was really a barrier until ClickHouse, the company existed and a hosted offering was available to even adopt the technology. So we're seeing some native adoption of technology accelerate because there is now a hosted offering to help those organizations that really believe in uh, using cloud services and those technologies that, again, want to start small and pay, you know, grow with the offering and pay as you go. Yeah, that makes sense. Have you, well, let me ask you a different way. Fairly recently, there's been some talk about people moving off of cloud and going back to on-prem because it could cost too much as you scale out. I'm just curious, like, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think there's a point of diminishing returns on cloud where it can make sense to start running stuff internally? Or do you think that these recent reports are a bit overblown? Yeah, we're not seeing that trend quite yet, I would say, for analytical workloads. There is, I would say, a trend for, uh, as, you, as your cloud offering, do you have the Snowflake model, again, where all the data exists in our account? So basically, the like us as a vendor, like you have to put your data into our account versus, again, the Databricks model where it's bring your own account. So this is still within cloud, but we basically take our data plane and we run it in your AWS account. And there's some reasons to do that. One is data locality. So having kind of your data analytical workloads be close to other workloads in that VPC, there could be cost reasons. There's some benefits to doing the latter for some users. So we are seeing interest in that, that at least when I was at Elastic, like I didn't see it as much. And now this bring your own account is increasingly a model that I'm seeing software vendors, cloud native software vendors introduce. And we don't have it yet, but we're considering it given that trend. We haven't seen so much move back on-prem, although we do have some, you know, I would say really visible users of ClickHouse that are fully on-prem. I mean, CDN Analytics is a good example. Like we talked about adopters earlier, Cloudflare, Disney Streaming, who both use ClickHouse for CDN Analytics. This, these are on-prem use cases for them. Like they're in their own data centers running on their own hardware and they don't plan to change that at all. So there's going to be certainly use cases and verticals where on-prem is going to stay. And it's going to be interesting to see if there's going to be significant move in some use cases back on-prem. If so, it would be for cost reasons. And again, I think we're well set up for that. For those users, you can run our software yourself and we will support you. We will have support contracts. For now, we haven't focused on like an enterprise version of ClickHouse. So we, it's a trend that we're watching, but honestly, I haven't seen a ton yet to report there. Yeah, there's, there's not much difference in running in your VPC with a you know calling back into a ClickHouse control plane versus running it on-prem, calling back into a ClickHouse control plane either. There isn't. Yeah. Once we have the bring your own account solution, you're right, Chad, like we could potentially extend that to like a managed on-premise offering. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Well, but yeah. I mean, there's no difference technically, but the people required, the equipment required, the power required to run all these things is what I think people are throwing the baby with the bathwater out. Yeah. The hardest part there is going to be like, can you really get the technical stack that you need? Like in bring your own account in something like Amazon or Google, right? You can say, look, I, you need to create a sub account for me. You need to give me this version of EKS or whatever other managed Kubernetes. Like I can specify the stack and it's easy for those customers to just spin it up. In on-prem, they may not have the same. They just be like, I have these boxes and that's it. Like you have to work with this hardware. And so it is a harder problem to solve because there's less consistency in on-prem environments versus bring your own account in a cloud provider, major CSP. Yeah, though probably most people will just say, you know, it's got to be deployed into Kubernetes on-premise. That's the only packaging we're giving to you so we can depend on some sort of exactly. underlying there infrastructure. To, exactly. Yeah, it would have to be something like that, like no leniency on some of these requirements so that it's more repeatable and manageable. Let's talk a bit about build versus buy decisions, because I think that's going to lead us into the next topic of pricing pretty well. So as a PM, how do you think about adding new features into the product for customers from the perspective of whether or not you build a feature internally versus you buy it from some company or do an acquire? Like you mentioned, you get, you all just acquired a company. Like, How do you think through those decisions, whether you're going to build it yourself or go and buy it from somebody else? 
so, so first of all, my bias as somebody who's a former engineer and, you know, I like solving challenges is to build. I like to build. I you know, work with talented engineering teams who like to build. So it's like I almost have to push myself to ask, like, why are we building this? Like, why aren't we buying? And there's kind of two aspects of buying. One is underlying sort of like services, like billing is a good example. At Elastic, we built our own, we had our own billing stack and probably made sense for us at the time. But as I joined ClickHouse, I found out there's this new group of vendors that are really focused on specifically usage-based billing and pricing. And so when we set out to build our cloud offering, we had really aggressive timelines and we explored partnering with these offerings. There's Metronome, Meter is the one that we went with. There's a few others in this category. And for us, this was definitely a win. Like it allowed us to move a lot faster on billing. Yes, it's a customer facing feature, but it was like how you build it, right? So the engineering involved in building it, like do you build it completely from scratch or do you use like a pre-built component from somebody who's, you know, another vendor in a space? And again, my knee jerk is like usually to build, but I have to ask myself like, why build? Why not buy? And the more I would say, the further the feature is away from your core sort of value proposition to the customer, the more you should be considering buying versus building. I mean, look, billing, we're just like, it's like the same. It's like, we, you need to add a credit card. There's a whole bunch of stuff that like, you don't even know about like payment processing in different countries. Like, I don't want to build that. Like somebody, let somebody else build that once and it just should be solved. And again, so like we use Meter and Stripe, right? And it's just, that's it. Like, like we don't even have to worry about any of these. And that just makes sense to buy and not build. Another one is more for, again, like kind of your product, right? So for us, our core database, like we would not subcontract some aspect of a cow's query execution tool. Like this is our crown jewels. And of course, it's open source. So we can't even buy there. But anywhere else like cloud native, right? That's where you might say, well, okay, like we need to build a better visualization tool. Should we, again, build it internally or should we acquire or buy a company that's already done that? And so with SQL Console is interesting. We were actually gearing up to extend our like very simple play UI, as we call it in open source, into a full, like I call it like play UI plus, like a, a cloud native SQL console. And like, I actually already had it all spec'd out. And then, you know, we found out that Archetype was interested in a buyer. And I looked at it and I was like, yeah, even though we were planning to build it, like this company has already built it and they built it much better than us, right? And also what's more importantly, if these folks were to join us, they just woke up and for the past three years thought about how do you build the best like SQL exploration experience for developers, right? And like, that's the part that like you really want. It's not just the product itself. It's like the people that deeply care about a problem. And so you really have to think about the team at that point. Do you have a capability that you haven't built yet, but you really want to? It's important. And have you found the right team that has built a product, but more importantly, can join your company and lead that, like be true thought leaders in this. And we just had a perfect storm with Archetype where we needed it, right? We didn't have the people. They had everything I just described. And so, so that worked out. Just as many times um, kind of M&A type things don't work out for one reason or another. The product doesn't fit. The team doesn't quite make sense. They want to work on something different and not what you are thinking of working on. So all of these aspects have to come together more for like a product merger, so to speak, like buying a product that is going to be part of your offering and integrate it into your offering. Tanya, that's a great explanation. Like, I, I totally get what you're saying about archetype being basically they wake up every day thinking about this experience and that made sense. Now, if they hadn't been in the position of saying, we're looking for someone to buy us and join forces with us, would you have licensed their technology? Like, how do you think about it from that perspective? So we thought about it. We actually have, like, interestingly, before we found out they were on the market, we were already partnering with them. And we had an they had an integration with ClickHouse. And we were even telling our customers, like, if you want a better SQL client than what we have, like this freebie tool, go and use Archetype. We thought about, I think they even floated the idea of licensing, but like it gets so complicated so quickly, right? Because I'm like, what, like the fees and whatever, it just like, and, and then... You can't evolve it. You have to be like, you're reliant on this component and you don't know where they're taking it. There were just so many complexities there. We considered it for a couple of weeks. We actually sat down and kind of did a little bit of kind of almost like a napkin roadmap. What would we do with this licensed component? And ultimately we were like, it's just like, there are too many unknowns. They're an early stage company. They can't guarantee to us like how this product is going to evolve. Like if we license them, you know, we didn't have ability to influence necessarily what the experience looked like. It just, it creates so many barriers because again, these products, they grow, right? Like you find out about your audience and they grow and we needed something that could grow with us as opposed to just be kind of like the static component that we licensed and that's it. It stays put. When you think about pricing, which is maybe a good segue, like 
how do you come up with pricing? And then if you decide to license another piece of technology, it also needs to come into the pricing equation and you could end up in a place where it's like just untenable. And like you said, it gets complicated quickly. So maybe let's talk about pricing, like early startup, you're there, you're like, okay, we need to sell this thing, obviously to make money. Do you just pick a number? How do you think through the initial pricing conversations and get to the first number? Yeah. So pricing was the hardest part, honestly, for me of coming up with this cloud offering, because in many ways, the roadmap setting, it just made sense. There are certain things you need in a SaaS offering. The pricing work was difficult because we set out to have a serverless offering that was a little bit abstracted from hardware. So you wouldn't just do like a traditional cost plus model where you're like, okay, these are my costs and I just do an uplift and that's it. Like that's kind of what we did at Elastic, right? We had like more like paths where we're like, well, this is what I'm running for you. And so whatever, you have this very simple, transparent model where you have like the hardware plus. We want it to be more kind of pay-as-you-go and more user-friendly in terms of how we, how and what we charge for. So I started by looking at the landscape, just seeing what others did. And again, there's just no consistency there for products like ours. Snowflake has this credits thing where they don't actually tell you like what hardware they're running and they charge you for some obscure credits. It's a very um, opaque, opaque model, right? And so you don't really, and Databricks has something similar, Databricks unit. And I heard from enterprise buyers that this actually made them very uncomfortable in some cases because they didn't know, like when they were committing spend, they didn't know actually what they were committing and how it would scale unless they've had many years of running these workloads and can almost know based on practice. So that's, that's the biggest drawback to opaque models is that you don't know upfront. You can't try to like estimate upfront what you're going to spend. You can only learn from moving your workload and then seeing like what it's going to cost you. You know, which again makes enterprise buyers nervous for the, for good reasons. The opposite of that is let's just be very transparent, but then charge you on like ten or twenty different dimensions. So again, not to like call out this example is necessarily negative, right? Because I think there's positives to it. But if you look at pricing for Fauna, which is a database, also like a serverless database, they have something like. I don't know, 12 different dimensions. It's, you know, pretty overwhelming. Now they've packaged it into tiers. And so like you buy a tier and they say like, if you're a developer or a team, like this is probably the right package for you. So you can simplify it, but then there's metered overage charges and it's a lot. It's just a lot. But I can guarantee you this model is very fair because ultimately like you're paying for each dimension separately. So exactly based on your usage, you're paying a fair price for your type of usage. The kind of in the middle model is a few simple dimensions that map to like the most important aspects of your usage, but not everything. And then you have to think about what are the most intuitive dimensions from which you could potentially forecast your usage. And also, how do you build the right margin to kind of almost hide the rest of the complexity for your users? And it's pretty hard. And I'll be honest with you, like that part, like it took us a while to figure out. We didn't get it right right away. We came out in ClickHouse Cloud with four dimensions, storage, compute, and then we had something called read and write Units, which were really there to kind of help, again, be more fair to certain type of write and read intensive workloads. Our users hated these units. They hated it. And they were just like, I don't care if it's more fair. It's confusing and scary. Take them away. And so we did. We did. But we ultimately had to build them into the margin, right? So it's a less fair model, but it's a lot more predictable. And our users are very happy with it. And so... So there's you know, no learn. variable component of IOPS anywhere? Nope. We, wow. But you know what? It puts the right incentives in place. So in order to take those units away, I had to go to my engineering colleagues and I said, guys, we're building this into the like the pricing model. Now it's it, like it's going to be a hit on our margins if we're kind of under the covers, not writing or reading efficiently for some of these workloads. What can we do? Can we actually change how our solution works in a separate storage and compute to reduce these costs? And guess what? As we were paying for it, we suddenly found ways to optimize these workloads. <laughs> Like 10x in some cases. So it was actually a positive change. I definitely like like where this model and like where you try to pick a few usage dimensions and then really think critically about how do you reduce those costs across the board for all of your customers, or at least reduce the variability so that you still end up with a model, of course, that doesn't completely blow out your margins, but also kind of makes, you know, kind of those charges more evenly spread across the customer base as you build the margin strategy. You're sort of relying on the statistical idea that not every customer is going to be insanely write heavy or insanely yeah. read heavy or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. And you learn, this is where, again, product analytics is very important. You have to ultimately look at usage. You have to look at your cost. You have to compare. You have to constantly recalculate your real-time margins, basically, as new workloads arrive. I mean, it happens sometimes like a new workload arrives and we're like, this workload is running in the negatives. Like we need to figure out how on the back end to, maybe not in the negatives, but like less than we expected in terms of a margin, right? So we need to figure out now potentially how to optimize it or 
if we really miss a dimension, like at some point, I can imagine us introducing some additional dimension, but ideally, I want to stay away from that to keep the pricing really simple for our users. Well, when you looked at this space of meter and metronome and these other types of SaaS billing solutions, I got to imagine that they build their pricing model, understanding how much it would cost you to build it yourself. And then they come in lower than that. So you're incentivized to use them instead of building it yourself. What other types of criteria were you evaluating them on? I would say actually for me, it was less like they, this is what they told us. We're going to save you whatever, a billing engineer or something like that. It's going to be so much simpler. This is not how I thought about it. I thought about it from time to market perspective. I had to roll out a cloud offering as soon as possible to our user base. And we just talked about also like the we need to partner with these you know, CSPs as quickly as possible to make sure that they're not incentivized to build like a popular you know, click house offering. Like time to market was everything to us. So it wasn't even about cost, like anybody that could help me get to market faster or get a new feature to market faster was something I would be willing to consider. And that was one of the biggest considerations, actually, going with a billing vendor, going with a marketplace vendor. We also part partnered with Tackle on being on all of the CSP marketplaces. It's all about time to value for me right now. But then how did you actually evaluate the vendors in that space? Did Meter get you to market faster than one of the other vendors for some reason? Yeah. Actually, so so for us, Metronome and Meter were the obvious sort of vendors to look at. They're both well-funded. The difference was for our use case, Meter had more out of the box. Like we had to build less with Metronome. There were just a few things that they were lacking and they, they were not on the roadmap. And, you know, it was pretty clear that they were focused on other things. And for us, this was like really core to our use case. And so instead of building around it and hoping that eventually they would deliver on it, we really bet on Meter. And it was ultimately about time to market and building less and outsourcing more. And they're also, I would assume, usage-based pricing. Yeah, yeah. the solutions are, are, are similar. Again, it just happened. Both are just early stage companies. And again, like having empathy for them, like you can't build everything at once. It just happened that Meter had more similar customers to us where they've already built more out of the box for our use case. And we were able to benefit for it, from it. So in terms of this question about margins, which you mentioned, all right, every time you buy a SaaS offering to build your SaaS offering on top of, it has to come out of that margin number, or you have to raise the customer's prices to account for the fact that you have this new expense for every time someone uses you, you have to call into them and that's an added expense. I don't know. So, so how does that factor into the analysis, I guess? It depends on how they price, right? Because if the cost scale scales linearly with your customers, that's a cost to really kind of like scrutinize because it, it is going to hit your margin. But if something like if something you're acquiring is more like a static cost that gets amortized across your customers, there's a different consideration there. So with Meter, it didn't it, like it's not like, you know, like I have a new customer with a big workload, let's say that's, I don't know, 10, allows me to charge 10x for based on the dimensions that we bill on. And suddenly Meter is 10x more expensive. That's not how it works, right? In the end, this is a customer that's going to, a large credit card is still just a credit card transaction, right, in the end. So it's a different scaling factor. So your revenue can grow exponentially, but your cost to meter would grow logarithmically or something like that. Yeah, it'll just grow with the number of customers, but not with the size of customers, right? Got if, it. If you get. There, there are some nuances to that because these companies also focus on some amount of analytics. And so there are a few other things to consider, but yeah, it's not going to grow with the exact sort of revenue that we are deriving from our customers. And is that... I mean, would you say that that's basically common for all of these, you know, tools that are meant to be used by other SaaS vendors? So again, they're early stage, and I, I wonder if they're necessarily going to keep their pricing as it is today. Right now, they're in customer acquisition mode, and they're, I would say their pricing is very attractive in terms of like value that they deliver and they're like the, kind of the versus the price that we pay. Now we'll see for them to survive as a business, right? They may need to at one point say, hmm, we're delivering so much value. Is there another way we can charge for our offering? We'll see how that evolves. I guess what I'm wondering is this, you know, is this sort of similar to the idea that, well, we'll go on cloud, so we'll get to market sooner. And then when we prove that it's successful, we can estimate the cost better. We'll bring it back on prem and take that 30% margin for ourselves. Whereas, you know, maybe two years from now you say, well, we're not going to pay for this anymore. It got us to market sooner, but we're going to build our own billing solution. It could happen, you know, but I th honestly, like we just talked about tech debt, like 
for something as critical as billing, if it's working and if it's not like, again, just like a huge hit on my margins, it's going to be one of the last things I want to rip out. It's so critical. It's already embedded. I actually think they have a good business model because once you've really built out billing for someone and it's, again, it's working, it's the piece that people are not going to want to touch unless it's like a really, really bad impact on your margins. I honestly don't see us moving off meter. We're very happy with them. And But Chad, you're right. It's because their pricing model is not something that has like a 30% impact on our margin. If it did, that would be a different consideration, but that's not how it works in terms of how they price their offerings. In terms of your pricing model and go-to-market, how do you think about it from the way that reps and SAs are compensated? So this is where, again, Snowflake was very, like we talked about their pricing model. And even though it's kind of opaque and credits, in the end, they sell credits to consume a service, right? And I think they were the first ones to sort of say that it's not enough to sell it. Like your customers actually have to consume these credits for you as a rep to ultimately like recognize as part of your compensation, right? The credit for having sold a customer. So it's about consumption, right? So so this is, I think, has been a very important development in pay-as-you-go offerings that simply saying, hey, like you've sold it, but they didn't consume. Because for us as a company, the customer has to consume the credits in order for us to recognize the revenue. So as a seller, your responsibility should be not just to sell, right, but also to sell the right thing and to make sure that your customers are consuming. That's how we think about it. Again, Snowflake was, I think, extremely innovating here, certainly from a business model perspective. I'm very inspired by them. And that's what we're doing at ClickHouse. That's interesting. So if you sell, you don't really sell like a multi-year deal. It's more like you're buying a block of usage. Exactly. It's more about sort of, yeah, prepaying for some usage and getting a discount for prepaying, but ultimately you have to consume it over some period of time in order, right, for us to kind of say, okay, like now you can bill us, right? And so it's, yeah, it's like almost like you're buying an option to use the service. Well, it's like a prepaid prepaid credit card or something that you deb, you deb it down on. But what about, but they also get comped on, you know, not pre not pre-committed spend, but also just ad hoc? They do. They do. So yeah. So so actually, this is a really important point. Many of our large customers don't want to pre-commit, especially not right away. Like they, they just want to put down a credit card and use and see after some time if it makes sense to pre-commit or not. But maybe for them, it doesn't even make sense for whatever reason. Like the comfort of going month to month is more important than pre-committing spend at some discount. And so we want our sellers to not only be incentivized to sell these committed deals, but also to just in their region foster pay-as-you-go usage. So yes, they get compensated on both the pay-as-you-go usage as well as pre-committed spend. And there's no penalty, so to speak, right, of not doing enough pre-committed spend because in the end, actually, pay-as-you-go usage is just as valuable in many ways, right? This is, you know, not discounted in many ways. And as long as the customer continues to be happy and continues to pay month to month, you know, we're happy. So in the end, it's about happy customers, you know, and really Pre-committing spend or not is really more for them. For some customers, they like the idea of budgeting or they have the kind of financing like cycles where they want to commit spend at certain intervals and in certain sums. And so for us, we're really trying to be agnostic to how they want to do business with us. I don't know if this little thread will make it into the final episode, but I've got to ask it anyway. Is there, have you ever thought about whether engineers should have a portion of their bonus or something that's based on revenue targets, just like an essay. Ooh, tough one. We talked about how PMs, at least I evaluate PMs on ultimately having a successful product in a market. What's interesting about, about that is I haven't been part of organizations where actual cash bonus is dependent on that, but I know in some organizations that is absolutely the case. There's like a component of at least product management compensation that has to do with ultimately hitting revenue goals. And so that's done. In engineering, again, I think it depends on what level, right? Like a certain level of engineering leadership, it probably does make sense. If you're an engineer where you, maybe you have less ability to influence the strategy, why should you necessarily like have like your compensation tied to decisions that you know, you're not necessarily empowered to make? We talked about organizations that are very hierarchical in nature. You could be part of that organization and you simply don't have a way to influence that KPI. So to me, compensation, if you're going to tie compensation to a KPI, you have to make sure that the individual has a way to influence that KPI. Otherwise, I don't know if that's really fair, so to speak. I would have to think about it, honestly. In the end, all of us, you know, are influencing products, but how directly is the question? 
Yeah. And the KPI might not be revenue, but it could be do customers even use your feature or not? And we can tell because we have this click house report that we run about which features get used. Again, like in a hierarchical organization where if, if as an engineer, you don't have influence on that decision of what actually gets prioritized, again, that could be not necessarily fair. So it's tough. It's tough, actually, I think, to figure out the right KPI that is business focused to kind of tie engineering compensation to. But if it was part of the whole organization's ethos where, you know, you have to convince the engineers to want to work on your feature. And they're going to want to work on the features that get used, that get them the bonus, blah, blah, blah. If they don't think your idea is any good, they're, they're just, they might just not build it. I actually think that would be a pretty healthy culture if that existed. I have not been a part of an organization where that where like that was the structure, right? Where you had to literally like recruit your team for your project. I actually like that. I think that would be something that would cause there to be an even higher bar to do what I said in the beginning, you know, convincing people to follow your vision as opposed to just telling them. Chad, I'm going to have to think about it. Maybe next time we talk, I'm going to be like, you know what? You gave me an idea and it completely transformed the ClickHouse organization. From now on, every product leader, including myself, has to convince you know, everybody, including every engineer, that this is a worthwhile feature to build. I think that would be actually, it seems a little bit like idealistic, but there's something yeah. there. There's definitely something there. It's right? a little like, bit hippie-esque or something, communesque. I don't know. I am always the time thinking about how would I do it if I started a company. And I, I have a lot of stupid ideas, but you know, I feel like some of them are- something there. Some of them are <laughs> hold some water. I don't I know. think that's too, it's not worth it. This is my take on it. It's, think about the telemetry you'd have to build into everything on an individual's time and the code they committed and whether they're doing pair programming, then you'd get this kind of structure where the incentives were only to build the things that you thought were gonna be used most. And we all know there's technical debt to pay off every day. There's kind of cross-cutting things that you have to build that are stability or whatever, like how do you measure that? Do you get a bonus when you debug someone else's code and then you dock their pay because they created software that was used but buggy? Like. I just don't think it's worth it. And if you look at engineers, how they're paid now, especially at startups that are potentially going to get acquired to go IPO, they have equity. That's part of their pay for joining an early stage startup, assuming there's some liquidity event. And if they join a public company, they're likely going to get stock if they're not joining a company that doesn't believe in sharing that equity with everybody. And again, I just, I don't know that it's worth it. I think Chad, you and I probably think like this and maybe Tanya a little bit because we used to be SEs and we're customer facing and we think about revenue a lot. But in most of my conversations with engineers, this is the last thing on their mind. Well, they might, they might, like I said, it might not be revenue. They might be comped on, they might get a bonus for, you know, lowering the expense of doing something and that's lowering tech debt. So there's lots of things that you could say, right? Yeah. That's more like a spiff, right? So like spiffs for engineers, especially for things that are hard to build and you're not getting traction to build them. I like that idea. Oh, that's a cool idea. Yeah. yeah. There are things like back to this barriers to selling idea, the top 10 list. If I could have taken some of my, I guess, coffers of budget for other things, which I did not have a big budget for anything, but like if I could have paid for features to get developed through engineering, I would have used it for that. Where I didn't feel like there was enough progress being made fast enough, which is subjective to me. So I actually think you bring us something very important, which is like, how do you maintain sort of engagement and innovation, especially again, like as you start getting into a phase of your development where you're working on a lot of obvious things and, you know, obvious, maybe boring, but like very needed things. But then how do you couple it with sort of like sprints of innovation? This is something I actually discussed at length with Rashid, who was, as you remember, creator of Kibana, a developer who was very passionate about keeping a flat organizational structure, lots of innovation. We discussed, like, how do you do this? Do you have, like, an innovation team? That kind of felt off because, like, why should one team innovate and it's, like, this be the chosen few? But then how do you sort of balance, you know, kind of innovation and experimentation with the boring stuff we all have to know we have to do because it's just part of growing an enterprise offering? And so one idea I had was, like, maybe you can have, again, some sort of sprints where, first of all, you have hackathons where you match sort of idea maker, like idea generators with folks they can kind of try to experiment and implement, right? So you could have, like, almost, okay, like, just throw your ideas into the hat, engineers pick, and you iterate on some ideas. And at that point, like, the most promising prototypes, you can basically say, okay, now these teams actually have ability to maybe roll off their regular teams and maybe they get backfilled, maybe it doesn't happen right away, but then you actually have this like tiger team go and develop this idea further. I think there's something there where you need to have some process is maybe not the right word, but culture, right? Cadence where you consider maybe even crazy ideas, 
you know, do like very minimal sort of like prototypes and then evaluate them as a team and say, hey, which like almost like vote, like which ones have promised, like which ones are going to truly invest in and product productize. And I think that's very important. Otherwise, you just sometimes miss like these opportunities to innovate also at the right time when time to market is important. We have the open AI trend right now. I think it's an, a perfect example. I have a very boring roadmap at the same time. You know, we have open AI and I'm like, how do I balance investing in this versus some things that are boring but necessary and very critical for me from a go-to-market perspective. And it's an active area of conversation. Well, I've always tried to get companies to do, and I've never really had them do it successfully, was to have them commit. You know, they said, we're just going to set aside a certain number of engineers, and they're just going to work on whatever the field tells them, that Steve's top 10 list or whatever. They're just going to go down the list, and it's going to be on a rotation. So they're going to, for three months, these people are going to do it, and then they're going to go back in. And then, th and then another group of people are going to come in for three months and do these rotations. And just work on whatever the field wants. You tell us what to do. We're not even going to question it. Like, you just tell us what's on your list. We're going to go down the list. And I don't know why I've never been able to convince a company to do that. Because it seems so obvious to me that it would be a good idea. But the hard part is engineers are not fungible. Like, one of your things on the list might be some really hairy problem that, needs, that only one or two people can solve. Literally in the whole company. It could be like, you know, like the insides of your query engine. And so in the end, like... Well, it's it doesn't like have to be can... 10 out of 10. They might get 5 out of 10 on the list. You know, I don't know. You could say, look, we're going to work on this feature from the top 10 list next. So we're, we need these three people to go do it or whatever. Uh, engineers don't like to be called fungible. Trust me. They're not. They each have special snowflake. That's trust why me. I'm not a VP of engineering. So, but I'm just floating the idea that like you can have a rotation to come solve these issues and utilize the collective intelligence of the field to say what we're going to work on. Yeah, that I completely agree with. Exactly. Like sort of like really sort of like combining folks that have the examples, right, of interesting challenges, not even necessarily solutions, just challenges, interesting problems to solve, interesting ideas, and like matching them with people eager to sort of prototype and experiment. That's what I'm talking about, like how to create that kind of culture and cadence, I think, is something that, I don't know, a lot of like product engineering leaders should be thinking about, because without that, I think you do get left behind. Like the way our industry is moving right now, you will get left behind if you don't create this culture of innovation. For sure. So Tanya, speaking of getting left behind, we only have a few minutes left and I want to talk about AI before we leave this topic behind. Like my first question is very simple. How are you using all these latest LLM tools in your daily life? Like, are you using ChatGPT or anything like that to do anything? I do. I actually I had ChatGPT plan my vacation because my family is very bad at coming up with ideas of where to go. And they kind of all look to me, but at the same time, they have conflicting, let's just say, preferences for what to do, right? My daughter wants to stretch out by the pool and my husband wants to go look at something cultural and I want to have some luxury. And we all have kind of like very specific things that we like. And I'm like, how do I combine that in like a week-long vacation also to a new destination that we've never been to? And so ChatGPT came up with like Greece Santorini for me, which I've never even heard of. So I was, and then when I, when I looked it up and I was like, perfect. At the most romantic spot in the world. Apparently, right? And I've never even heard of it. Like, this is just like how limited I am and like my knowledge of options, right, to travel. And so it was pretty interesting, like, to use it in that way. Cause like it gave me some other ideas. I think it came up with Florida and I was like, well, I've been there. Like, there was like three or four suggestions total. And one of them was like jackpot and the rest were like, so it was quite useful. But in addition to that, of course, I've played around with it, just like asking questions and seeing, like I, I asked it, is product management valuable? Maybe not in those. I think I asked, you know, like, is there a reason to have a product manager? It gave me a pretty good answer. It said yes, it, but it had some good reasons for why you need a product manager. Are, is ClickHouse using it to write code? Yeah. So more importantly, inside ClickHouse, we're talking about what to do, both from a standpoint of using it in our offering. And one interesting area is actually helping our users learn some of the unique features of ClickHouse, you know, as they're kind of getting up to speed. Because we're a SQL compatible data store, but we have ex like extensions, right? And so we have extensions for analytics that may not be sort of intuitive for every user out there. And so even for like a SQL, a person who knows SQL, starting with a natural language query and saying, hey, how would you do this in ClickHouse? Data set, and then chat GPT or GPT, right, API suggesting to you a SQL that is ClickHouse specific to do it is actually very valuable. So we're investigating that. We may need to actually pair the GPT model with our own extensions and our additional post training to make a perfect solution there. But it's a very promising use case. And then ClickHouse itself, there's, as I mentioned, there's interest in using ClickHouse to store and search embeddings, because in the end, to have a kind of a very tailored experience for your users, you, need, you may need to do, again, post-processing, you may need to simply cache certain embeddings and search faster. So 
there's lots and lots of use cases where you want to combine an analytical data store with powerful vector and embedding search. So ClickHouse is not a vector database, right? It's not today, but it has already some functions you know, that lend itself well. But let's just say doing kind of like generic search of vectors. And there's lots of interest in expanding that. So for instance, there's experimental support for Anoy index, you know, which is one, one of the ways you would index and search vectors. And right now, we certainly wouldn't call it a vector store. But given how fast the ClickHouse community moves, I wouldn't rule out the possibility if we talked in six months. I'd be like, guess what? We're now a vector store. I would be very curious, Tanya, if anyone internally is thinking about building like a tutorial or a YouTube video on how to use ClickHouse with something like LaneChain, let me know and I'll try it I out. I will. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We actually will publish a series of blogs within a week or so, Steve, exactly on this topic. So I will, yeah, I will refer you to them. Okay. So we can include those in the show notes too, because we're not going to publish this for a little while. So, because I am trying to find one that I like and like right now it feels like Pinecone is the one. Yeah. But yeah. I also have this thinking that Elastic might be a better one-two punch for me because it does both the search side and the, well, it's actually got multiple things, but. Exactly. Yeah. And that's where exactly is the question. Do you need a specialized vector store and vector search solution first? Everything else is sort of an afterthought. Or do you need an analytical data store like Elastic or ClickHouse powered with vector search or embedding search? as part of it and what's your use case. And I bet you there isn't like a one size fits all answer, but we, we certainly see the need for the latter as well at ClickHouse. I, uh, that makes sense. Some of my friends are even questioning the idea if we need anything new, like why do we need to invent a new or have a new vector database when we could just store all this stuff in an existing one and we don't have to learn a new technology. So I'm kind of going down that rabbit hole as well. But it feels to me like that kind of thing where just because you use one technology for one problem does not make it in your mind applicable to the next one. In fact, it kind of has the opposite effect. Like I remember this at Elastic where people were like, oh, I'm going to use you for search, but then I'm using Splunk to look at my logs from Elastic. And I'm like, oh, did you know that you could use Elastic for that? And they had no idea. They didn't even think about it. So it's one of those things where just because Elastic is where it is, it's established, well-established now. ClickHouse is pretty well-established, but growing quickly, it seems. And they may not just think of it as that thing, right? So unless you specifically tell people, this is what you use us for, they may go find the tool that says, this is what you use us for. Well, one of the proofs to us actually in this whole journey was as we were finding out about companies that were getting funded in this space, one of them was Chroma. And Chroma is a vector store that's basically built as a thin layer on top of ClickHouse. And we were like, wow, like this is like where it became really clear that, you know, you may not need something so specialized that with additional investments in a General, more general purpose analytical data store like ClickHouse, you can combine really the best of and like general purpose analytics and specifically analytics for the vector search space as well. I think you guys can tell from listening to this episode that as the great poet once said, her experience and insight, they truly astound in the realm of product. She's the best to be found. Two hours of this episode. I don't know that we're going to be able to cut very much, to be honest, because everything here was... Just amazing. Thank you, Tanya, for joining us today. Thank you, Chad and Steve, for having me. It was awesome. Yeah, thank you.